بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذي فرض عليك القرآن لرادك إلى معاد قل ربي أعلم من جاء بالهدى ومن هو في ضلال مبين. You know how they say a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. I say it begins with one dua, a dua that I made that one day I'll visit Allah's house, and today I'm embarking that journey. So guys, I've just arrived at the airport. Um, it was an hour journey, as you can see. This is the runway. The airport is pretty empty today, man. Like, there's nobody here. I guess we're the only one going to be in the flight. But, nevertheless, got mixed feelings. Our flight is a connecting flight from Stansted, London to Istanbul. That's where we're going to wear the... It's called the Ahram. And then from there, we're going to make our way to... Um, Jada. I still had a few minutes till my flight so I decided to have some sushi and it was disappointing. You can never trust aviation food. It's a bit like gamble. Sometimes it's good. It was very windy here man. As you can see, I'm about to take the plane in. It was very windy. Very windy man. Not taking their time like slow coaches on the Leaving your children on board is the finest example of parenting in the 21st century but we move on after traveling several hours on the turkish finest aircraft known to men we arrived in jadda a painful but a restless journey so we got the aram one now me and my dad so now we're making our way to jadda the flight is going to be four hours Yeah, so I've just arrived and now we're making our way to um, straight to Makkah right now. It's going to be a one hour drive and uh, the traffic is not looking good today. It's around uh, 1 a.m. in the morning around here and the weather is really good, not too hot. Traffic is not the best as you can see. We'll see you on the other side. Trends are running high and yeah, let's see how this goes. From this point onwards, I decided to close all the cameras and focus on the Umrah. This is my first Umrah and I just wanted to be between me and Allah. So today I am going to go to complete my second Umrah. The first Umrah I've done, uh, I just didn't use the camera or anything because I just wanted to basically focus on my first Umrah. But the second Umrah I'm going to do, I'm going to show you guys step by step all the important stuff i'm sure you guys are aware of what you have to do but i thought maybe you know it looks nice so i'll show you how it's done step by step the only thing is when you're doing your second umrah the mikat is going to be at a different place so we're going to go to the mikat first it's called the uh, aisha mosque so we're going to go get changed do our um, ahram from there and then we're going to come back to the haram and start our umrah Currently the time is around 2 o'clock so I hope that I can do Umrah before the Fajr because after Fajr it gets really really packed and inshallah uh, it's going to be a really good experience for me um, because the first time my dad helped me do it step by step but now I think this time I'm going to do it on my own and, and I'll take it easy and slow because the first time it was very very people too much people after Fajr so it took me maybe two hours to complete it but inshallah this time it should be done with between one hour and a half or so so i'll take you every step of the way hope you guys are enjoying the vlog so far and yeah we are now making our way to masjid al aisha mosque which is our nearest mikat located outside the haram boundary for those who don't know what mikat is mikat is where you enter the state of haram where you go shower and read to nafal of intentions of completing an umrah and from there you make your way to the haram so i'm now just entering the haram as you can see that's the 
gate of the Haram, which I'm going to enter from. And yeah, it's Fajr time about in the next like two hours. So until then, I'm going to try to do the Umrah if I can. But yeah, it's, it's getting a bit busy now. Upon entering the Masjid al Haram, I tend to lower my gazes so that when I get closer to the Kaaba, I get to see at first sight and make the dua. They say when you see the Kaaba for the first time, every time you visit, whatever dua you have in your heart comes true. So having that in mind, I lower my gazes with the intention to see Allah's repentance and His guidance. Okay, Tawaf is done now, so now we're gonna have some zum zum. Now we're gonna go for Tafa and Harva. Um, it's where we have to walk, and it's starting to get a little bit busy now. For those who don't know the story behind Safa and Marwa, Safa and Marwa commemorates the struggle of Hajar, Prophet Ibrahim's wife, PSP upon him, who ran between these hills seven times seeking water for Prophet Ismail, her son. According to Islamic history, Prophet Ismail struck his foot on the ground which led to a spring of water that emerged with Allah's blessings known as the Zamzam water. Alhamdulillah, I've done my Safa and uh, Narva. So my Umrah is now complete. The act of cutting hair after Umrah signifies the detachment from the worldly possession and submitting to the Almighty Allah. So today was a busy day with the Umrah and everything. Today I'm going to get an early sleep because tomorrow we're going to do the Ziyarat. We're going to go see the mountains and everything. So we have to wake up just one hour before Fajr so we get space in the Haram because it gets really packed. And then after that, uh, we're going to take a cab all the way to all the main ziyarats because I've heard that there are not many ziyarats like a uh, place of attractions basically mountains and stuff um, in Mecca because it's just mainly the Haram and a few places but in Medina I've heard that there's a lot of ziyarats so I'm gonna show you the ones in Mecca today I mean tomorrow and hope you guys enjoy it and are enjoying it while watching the vlog and inshallah I'll see you tomorrow Okay, so now me and my dad and my uncles, we're going to the ziyarats in Mecca and inshallah we're going to show you all the places and yeah, excited? Huh? Yes. Yeah, that's it inshallah. We are now on our way to climb the cave of Thor. This cave is where the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his companion Abu Bakr Sadiq found shelter when fleeting from the Quraysh. Oh my god, look at that, all you can see is mountains around. Climbing the cave of Sor and it is long and this is the one that where the Prophet Muhammad he came and then the spider made a web. Damn, and I'm still climbing and the altitude is getting thinner. I got myself water so inshallah if I get thirsty I'll drink it but look at that. My God. What going with dad? He's there. His water? Bunny? He needs some water. Uh, I don't know how long this cat's been up here. So the local guy said that, you see the thing of they're making that road. So people can travel straight up to the Hira. I mean the Sor. The cave, you know. Dad's there. Jenna, yeah. you got more stamina than me today. What's going on? That's the clock tower over there. It's been more than an hour and we're still climbing. Could you imagine, like back in the days, it wasn't like this. It was raw rocks. So the prophet, he did this all on himself, you know. Imagine how much power he had, strength he had. It's crazy, man. God damn, this is so beautiful. 
I lot of the Hajis that do ziyarat of the cave of Thor with the sole intention of visiting the place because this was the place where our Prophet once done Qiyam. This is a blessed place. So they do Salat or Salam to the Prophet. They read to Nafal, which is not obligatory, but it is a rewarding. And that was the end. Now we're going downstairs. It's a very tight space over there and a lot of people want to read Nafal, which is amazing. But it gets really busy. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, after many years I had this in my heart that I would really want to come here. Coming up was so difficult, but I just had Allah in my heart and had him in my mind and I made the war. Like, every time I come, I come here again, and he just helped me and gave me strength. Ah, it's been like 45 minutes and I'm still climbing down. My legs are so sore right now. Time. <sighs> Guys, if you ever come to this cave, it's called Sor. If you ever come to this cave, just be prepared. Get like two water bottles and don't rush like I did. You'll tire yourself out and coming down, it's gonna hurt. Take like 20 minute breaks in between, you know, 20 minute breaks. And after that, you saw it, you know what I mean? Wear nice shoes, like nice running shoes. So. Because some of the stuff is slippery here and it's going to take some time, you know. My dad got so much energy today. Look, you know, this guy, he climbed up the mountain without sitting down. I'm the one who sat down like a few times. Alhamdulillah, I have reached at the bottom of the mountain and I am done. I'm naked. I'm telling you guys again, if anybody comes again upstairs, please make sure you carry water and come in the morning time after Fajr when it's nice and hot. And you're gonna get thirsty and you're gonna get dehydrated and it's gonna be crazy. Now we are making our way to Masjid Nimra. Masjid Nimra marks the location where the beloved Prophet, peace be upon him, stayed before delivering his final sermon on the plain of Arafat. Being among the most sacred Islamic monuments even today, during Hajj, it's duty of the Imam of Masjid Nimra to deliver the last sermon before the Horan Asa prayers are performed. Masjid Nimra has 64 doors, 10 main entrances, 3 domes, 6 minarets and has the capacity to hold 350,000 people at once. So every year the Hajjis come here and this is where the khutbah for the Hajj, the special one, is given here. It's a huge mosque. Look at the courtyard of the mosque. It's huge. I don't think I can cover everything but I'm going to show you as much as I can. So they say they open it once a year for only for Hajj and it's just beautiful man everywhere i look um, the minarets are beautiful so, yeah. after passing through arafat we are now entering Muzdalifa. in this place at the time of hajj the hajis stone the three pillars known as the jamarats as the shaitan so now i'm gonna show you the place where the shaitan is basically during hajj where they hit the stones um, basically, this area is restricted at the moment, but I'm going to try to zoom in as much as I can. There's three parts of it and it's under this camp. So I'm going to try to zoom in it. Inshallah, you guys can just get a bit of ziyarat done from there. So under that is a big stone of the Shazan. I'm going to try to zoom in. This is where the people um, hit with the stones. Um, but this is the place um, where people come for Hajj. And this tether over here, is already he got personal issues with the shaitan right now this brother got personal issues now i'm going to show you the exact place where prophet ibrahim stood to sacrifice prophet ismail i couldn't really get the access to see the maqam myself but i try to zoom in as much as i can so you guys can get the ziyarat now i am making my way to medina but before I do that, I'm going to show you the Mecca, the Haram properly, and I hope you enjoy the montage.
So now I'm making my way to Medina, waiting for my guy to pick me up. It's so loud here because there's so many passes. They just came from Medina and I'm making our way, inshallah. It's going to be a four hour drive. Alhamdulillah, we are still on the way as you can see. Um, all around me is just desert and sand and it's raining at the same time. This is very rare, you know, it doesn't really happen in this country. But I'm going to show you what's around. I've arrived in Medina so we're about to check in the hotel and basically we are very close to the Masjid Nabawi so basically at the end of the road if we turn right you're gonna see the Masjid Nabawi but I'll take you later on it's very peaceful here and I'm going to show you the Prophet's road of Mubarak and this is where we go and give salam and then I'm gonna show you the Masjid Nabawi in daylight and at night time how it looks Ya Rasulullah salamun alayhi Ya Rafi'a shani wa taraji Rasulun, 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 Rasulun As you can see behind me is the famous minaret of the Rasulullah. It's beautiful, it's just shiny green. It's made by the Ottomans. Assalamu alaikum, guys. Today is such a beautiful day. As you can see, I am well recovered from all the umrahs I've done in Mecca. Today I'm going to the exhibition museum of the Rasulullah's uh, house they've made. And I'm going to show you around what's inside. They said that they're going to show some bit of history. We have to buy tickets from here, which are like 15 real to enter. That's the ticket for the museum. Uh, shukran, thank you. Shukran, thank you so much. So that's the entrance of the museum, as you can see. They've told us to wait in the waiting area. I think somebody's going to maybe do a tour 
But well, that's the museum basically, that's the entrance. Inspired by our lovely Arabic speaking tour guide, I decided to take over this segment and document it myself. When Sahel and Sohail came to note that the Prophet desired to buy their land for erecting a mosque over it, the two orphans volunteered to give it to him as a gift. As they were orphans, the Prophet desired to pay them. Abu Ayyub al Ansari became the donor of the land and paid the full price. The first expansion of Masjid al Nabawi took place right after the Battle of Khaybar. Width was increased by 20 meters and the length by 15 meters. The height of the roof was increased from 2.5 meters to 3.5 meters by the Khalifa Uthman, paid for the land this addition of the mosque. By this time, the mosque wasn't just a place where the obligatory prayers were performed, it was also a place where teachings were carried out, politics were discussed, delegations were received, and needy was catered for. The total area of the mosque was increased to about 2200 square meters and the height of its walls were increased to about 3.6 meters. The masjid was extended to the northeast and the west side, each now measured about 47 meters, making the masjid almost square. During the time of Suleiman the Magnificent, the east and the west walls of Masjid al-Nabawi were rebuilt. A new steel covered dome was replaced and the tomb of the Prophet peace be upon him, the Gate of Mercy, was resurrected in the 1870s. In order to accommodate millions of people who are travelling to the Masjid al Nabawi each year, the Ottomans started to demolish places around Masjid al Nabawi which they bought the land to expand the Masjid. And during the Saudi rule, the Masjid al Nabawi underwent several modifications. In 1951, as per the King's orders, Places around the mosque were demolished to expand the prayer hall. A space northeast and northwest to the mosque, new minarets were fabricated and previous ones were recasted in Mamluk revival style. To lodge religious readings and Quran, a library was erected along the western wall. In current time, the Masjid al has a capacity to hold 1 million people at once. It has 10 minarets, each minaret has 105 meters height. In the modern day, Masjid al Nabawi is suited on a rectangular plot and it has two stories. The Ottoman prayer hall, which is the oldest part of the Masjid al Nabawi, which lies towards the south. It has a flat paved roof topped with 27 sliding domes on a square basis. And that was the end of the tour. They have a little shop that you can buy a souvenir from, which is, I think, is beautiful. A lot of history, um, we're not allowed to record that much, only the last pieces that I were allowed to but I managed to somehow sneak in like a few areas and that is the Prophet's Mosque Expansion Exhibition Museum which is just beautiful as you can see hope you guys liked the, the tour I basically gave you I enjoyed it, if you guys ever come to Medina please visit this and next to the museum is the is the Masjid al Nabawi. I'm gonna show you. So that is the mosque. I mean that's the museum, and that is the Masjid al Nabawi. As you can see. Assalamu alaikum, guys. So today I'm gonna show you the ziyarat around Medina. I hope you guys enjoy. It. It's gonna be a lot of places. I'm gonna cover, inshallah, cover everything as I can and I hope you enjoy it I'm gonna give you a little history as well behind it and inshallah you'll get to see every little aspect of Madina this is the mosque of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib he was a foster brother and companion and a parental uncle to the Prophet peace be upon him he was martyred in the Battle of Ahud on the 22nd March in the year 625, Islamically known as the third of Shawwal in the third Hijri. On the left side of the mosque is where he was buried and behind the mosque are the mountains for Uhud as you can see. He was from the Banu Hashim tribe. He had four children, Umama, Amir, Yala and Omara. His occupation was a military officer and he was succeeded by Khalid ibn al-Walid. This is Masjid al-Qiblatayn. The mosque was named as the Mosque of Two Qiblas 
because part of the prayer was performed facing Jerusalem and the rest was towards Mecca. This historic event took place on the 15th of Shaban when Prophet peace be upon him led his companions during Dhuhr prayer, then was commanded by the Quranic revelation to face towards the Kaaba. Thus, this Kaaba became the Qibla for all Muslims around the world. As you can see in the video, the tile on the wall is a symbol of what the Qibla was. Now it is facing towards Makkah. This is the Masjid al Khandaq, the Mosque of the Trench, which is also referred as the Mosque of the Conquest. This is the modern mosque at the site. It is connected to the Battle of Trench, which took place during the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. On the east side of the masjid, there is a hill. On the top of the hill was where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had his camp. And on the bottom of the hill was the camp of the Hazrat Sulaiman Farsi, who was the advisor for the battle to the Prophet Muhammad. This is Masjid al Quba. This is the first mosque built in Islam. According to Islamic history, it is said that the Masjid al Quba was the place where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, stayed and performed salah on the first night after arriving in Medina. Later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger constructed the Quba mosque on the exact spot. The area of the mosque floor is 13,500 square meters, and the area of the mosque premises is 5,860 square meters, including 7,000 prayer places for women and has four minarets. The mosque can accommodate up to 20,000 worshippers. The Al Ghar's Well is a historic water well in the city of Medina. Traditionally, it is believed that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, drank from this well and also requested to be bathed with this water after his demise. Ibn Majah quoted Ali ibn Talib saying that the Prophet once said, when I die, wash me with seven water skins from al Ghaz well. Now we are entering the garden of Sulaiman Parsi. This is where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, planted 300 palm trees to free Sulaiman Farsi. Sulaiman Farsi was a companion to the Rasulullah. His story began when he traveled to the Arabian Peninsula and was betrayed and sold to a Jew in Medina. After meeting Rasulullah, he recognized the signs that the monks described. So then he converted to Islam and he was rescued. As we travel further down the mountain valley across Saudi Arabia, we are now heading towards a place called Wadi Ajin. Wadi Ajin is famously known for its phenomena where the cars travel automatically without being assisted. So today I am going to experience that myself and see what it is all about. The car is on neutral, he's not doing any acceleration and the speed is 120 kilometers. This is the Saudi Arabian area called Wadi Ajin and uh, this is the well-known phenomena where the gravitational pull is very strong from the south of the mountain. As you can see, the car is rolling itself all by itself. And now we're hitting on 120 as you can see in the speedometer. And this is a beautiful place. It's in situated with just mountains, trains. You can go do um, toe cutting. Um, you can like go on a horse riding. It's a beautiful place. And my dad just gave me some sweet corn. There's a guy who's selling sweet corn here. Time to do quad biking. I'm so excited for this. It looks amazing. You can go off road. Like I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go ham on this, bro. So guys, we are gonna go all the way into that mountain valley. And the quad. 
road biking just ended. It was the best experience so far. Alhamdulillah. My clothes are all ripped and dirty, but this was worth it. This was worth it. Now we are making our way to the last destination of the trip. We are visiting Medina's biggest date farm. I go to try many different dates I can't even name. There are so many variants of the dates and I would recommend that rather than buying it from a marketplace, go to a date farm and buy it because you never know which ones are going to be fresh or not. Secondly, the dates that you are going to taste that I'm going to bring home are 100% fresh from this year. So enjoy. And just like that, it was the end of a beautiful journey. I hope everybody enjoyed the vlog. And I just wanted to showcase a few memories I had on the trip with me to Umrah. And I hope that everybody, inshallah, Allah, then Allah invites them to his house. Inshallah, one day everybody gets to do Umrah and even Hajj as well. I hope you guys enjoyed the vlog. Subscribe to my channel and like and comment. And inshallah, until next time, I see you soon.